it's like talking to anyone. Hmm. <laughs> There's so many people walking oh, around. Oh, yeah, with, with their headphones on. Their mics. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, uh, Ruth, Ruth Peterson Shore, thank you for taking the time to, to talk and give me the opportunity to talk about to talk about your uh, your artwork and your life a bit. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for including me on my work. It's not often that I spend a lot of time talking about it, so it's uh, it'll be an interesting process. Mm. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I have some some of my favorite works of yours here um, that I'd like to talk to. I think I'll kind of just reference them or like kind of sprinkle them throughout the conversation. Okay. Um, but yeah, just to kind of get started, for those that are kind of in, unfamiliar with your work, can you just tell us a bit about your your mediums that you work in? The mediums, um, I've worked in a lot of mediums. I majored in sculpture because I figured I'd always paint. And so in sculpture, I worked in metal, I welded, and I worked in clay, and I was forced to work in wood, which wasn't my favorite. Um, I paint in oils now. Um, I have painted in acrylics and latex, and when I did murals and other kinds of painting, I used watercolors and ink wash. I've used gouache, I've used tempera, I've used um, finger paints, I've used uh, mixed media stuff. I have painted on different surfaces from canvas to wooden panels to plexiglass and glass to, mm -hmm. you know, concrete walls. So um, it's sometimes the media is driven by the content. Sometimes the content is driven by the media medium. Mm. So, yeah, 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 that's a. Uh... I'd, l I'd love to to kind of go into that more that what you just thought sure. said sometimes the content is driven by the media and sometimes the media is driven by the content um, before we do though uh, can you also just uh, like uh, talk a bit about your your style too as an artist my style is an artist well with my own work my fine art um, I've done commercial work as well mm -hmm. um, I start with a concept and then at some point the painting takes over and uh, I generally work in series so um, right now I'm working on two series simultaneously I'm working on the Chasm series which is behind us and I'm working on musical moments which are in watercolor and ink and some uh, ink wash and so they're they're two different themes, two different, um, two different concepts, but uh, the, th the theme that goes through them is that each piece takes on its own life. And if it doesn't, I'm usually not very happy with it. Um, I, I, I start with an idea. I usually sketch out some ideas of what I want to do. And mm -hmm. um, like with this series, I, I mapped it out pretty carefully, especially the diptych over there, uh, because it needed to come together. But, um, but while I'm working on it, the, the mood of the piece and the, the style of the piece is a combination of I couldn't do this painting on glass. It just wouldn't work. Because of the color, or no, just... because of the precision. Um, glass has a tendency. The way I work on glass, it has a tendency to kind of drip, and I like that. Mm. Um, so I like um, planned spontaneity. So I can give you a really good example in sculpture. So. I did a lot of raku firing, which mm. you take the, you uh, bisque the piece at a low temperature and then you glaze it with specific glazes. And then while the piece is molten, well, when the glaze is flowing, you remove it from the kiln and move it to something. It sets it on fire. I love fire. Mm. Uh, it sets it on fire and then you 
close it off so it smokes, and then you can reignite the fire by giving it oxygen again, uh, you know, opening the lid of the can or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you plan this idea that this piece is going to be in a turquoise crackle, but it's sitting next in the kiln next to a, a, a piece that is a luster, and it gets kissed by the luster. So... Sorry, kissed? What do you mean by that? It means that some of the colors flow from one piece to another. Oh, I see. So you can plan it, and then it changes. And the way I work with watercolors very often is um, sometimes wet on wet, or I'll add a lot of water, or I'll spray it with soap suds afterwards, or um, I'll do different things where the piece takes over. I have some idea, but not a lot of control. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I, I like, I think it keeps the work fresh. I, um, I'm never bored. Mm. I, I don't know any artist who's ever bored. I really, I don't. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, so my process is usually to sketch, you know, to think about something I'm thinking about, um, how much I love music and I'm not a musician and mm -hmm. I love to one of my favorite things is when I'm at a show live music is my favorite I'm at a show is to sketch during the show mm. and then bring it home and work from the sketches that I did during the show and sometimes it's directly on top of what I did during the show and sometimes it's taking pieces of it and putting it together into a different composition but I like the vibrancy of working live and then taking it back and maybe I'll take a couple of photos too and and use those as reference but um, but the excitement of live music is something that is inspiring for me so but then I bring it home and I'm in my room and working on it and it's a different world and it's a different life so I let it be you mm -hmm. know I don't you know, I did graphics and I, I do graphics sometimes and I do illustrations sometimes and those are, you know, what you say you're going to draw is what you're going to draw. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do that with my own work and sometimes right. it takes me to places that I really like and sometimes not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, I've done a complete watercolor and thrown it away and done the whole thing again. So, mm. um, yeah. Yeah, I did notice... Uh when we get into your creative process later, I did notice when I was looking through some of your work that there were multiple iterations, it seemed, of the same exact piece, but with different mediums. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely have noticed that before um, when looking at your work. Can you speak at all to your, like, your themes of your work that you like to um, kind of express? I know in your artist statement on your website, you, you talked a lot about how you like to represent the dichotomies of life. And I know we talked about it a bit before the podcast started, like some examples of those, but just for people who are learning about your work, are there, are there themes that you really try to um, represent consistently? I consider myself a narrative artist, an emotionally narrative artist, which means that one of the things that I feel about emotions is that they're universal. But mm. the specifics that bring those emotions up for people are not. Those are the stories of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that my story on a page is seen as someone else's story in a different way. I have paintings that people have looked at and said, you've painted my childhood. And it brings up really strong emotions and they connect to it in some way. So the dichotomies of life are, of course, life and death. And most of us have experienced those extremes. Mm. Birth and death are total opposites and yet they bring up emotions. How many people cry when they're really happy and really moved? Um, but it's, I think some of the themes of my work 
which you'll see throughout our emergence. And by that I mean coming out from being hidden, coming, you'll see a lot of cloaks in my work and a lot of nudes, very, it's more rare to see people wearing clothes. I feel like cloaks and, and nudes are um, ambiguous as far as date and time. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't date someone. As soon as you put an article of clothing on someone, you know what year it is. Mm -hmm. There's a painting in my kitchen, you know exactly what year it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I like that creation of, you can, you can put yourself into it more easily mm -hmm. if it's not dated. And um, so, when I say emergence, a lot of us, as we've grown, have come into ourselves more. Some, when we were very young, I myself, when I was very young, I was pretty much who I am. And then life happens, and those things get buried, and, and you need to find a way to open yourself up again to the world. Mm. And I... And so the, the theme of hidden and open, kind of like Purim, but, um, but not really, um, an emergence coming into yourself, showing who you are, and there's rawness in a lot of my work. Mm, um, you chose definitely. some pieces that are pretty raw. Um, and I don't, with my own work, I don't, I'm not bound by what's going to look good in, you know, someone's bedroom or living room or whatever. I had a friend come over once and I had done a painting about a particularly difficult thing that had happened. And she said, how can you live with that? And I said, that's how I live with that. You know, mm -hmm. by, by creating that painting, which is, incredibly disturbing to look at. Mm. Um, you know, nobody wants Guernica in their living room either. <laughs> yeah. So, it, yeah. it doesn't bother me that, uh, and some of my work is pretty and nice and wonderful because there's parts of life that are pretty and nice and wonderful and joyous. Yeah. But not all of it is, and, and very often it's got both. Mm -hmm. both elements mm -hmm. you know um, this painting is a good example of that the person who's made their peace with you know being in this chasm and the person who keeps trying to climb out the oh, yin wow. and the yang yeah um, we all have our you know there's moments of, of great joy in life and there's I acknowledge there's moments of deep depression and anxiety and, and difficult times. So mm -hmm. that's what the themes of my work are. Yeah. Wow, that was really well said. And I just want to say before we move forward, I really admire that you can, you, you say something as um, to someone who is less familiar with like for lack of a better word, like art speak, you say something very like like emergence, but then you don't just leave it there. You actually unpack what it means in detail. And I really like how you keep it simple like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, because as someone like who's kind of new to uh, not art appreciation, but just art in general, it's nice to kind of to hear it simplified uh, and said. <laughs> we have a guest. My, my... My joy, one yes. of my joys. Does this does this guy ever inspire any artworks for you? Oh, I I have drawn, buddy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> absolutely. I get to you know do a mother and child. I get to do a puppy, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. I think actually now would be a a good time to bring up two of the works that I really uh, liked because I think they represent what we're talking about, which is the um, the vibrant colors of a work like Magical, and, and I'll be able to put this up on the screen later, but like Magical yeah, is just like 
to me, I look at this and I see uh, a young girl who's like, it's like newness, life, like yeah. Uh, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, so much emotion and almost like she's kind of seen the world for the first time and it's, it's all very new. Um, and then I move forward through your works and it's like a moment later I'm looking at something like this, yeah. emptiness, yeah, which is uh, dark and uh, to me brings up feelings of like, of like lo when I feel very lonely, like that's, and, and alone in the world. Um, I know that's not necessarily what it is for you, but like that's what I see when, when I look at it. And it's like, yeah, so you definitely are very versatile in your, in your, the themes that you represent in your art, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I, I am very versatile in my themes and in my medium. I can do really a lot of line work and I can do pure um, flowing watercolors and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on where I am personally and what I'm trying to bring out. You know, there I, I can do a really joyous piece if I'm not in that space because I'm wanting to be there. I'm wanting to see the joy. Um, I worked with young children for many, many, many years. And one of the things I loved about them was that it in a second you can move into the joy. And there's a, a theory in psychology that if you can have one moment of joy, you can become you can get beyond depression or ha and back to a place where you're more stable and happy mm -hmm. and so it doesn't always work but one of the things you can that's nice is to find that joy even if you're not feeling it yourself at the moment mm -hmm. um so magical actually was you know based on i had seen a photo of one of my nieces my grand nieces and that brings me joy so mm -hmm. you know um but there are the emptiness piece um it's something that everyone can relate to you related to it in terms of loneliness of being alone mm -hmm. of missing a part of yourself and Nobody lives on Sunnybrook Farm, and that's a reference for another generation, but Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm had this perfect life. Nobody mm. has that. Yeah. And we all have moments where our heart is pulled out of us and torn, and, and we're empty inside, mm -hmm. and we just don't have any more to give. Yeah. And sometimes we still need to give to people and we still need to walk through the motions but it helps to to be raw to be real mm. um sometimes when i do really precise work for a while i need to do that you know cuz that's part of who i am you know and Nobody gets through life without that. It just, there is a difference in quantity and in, you know, um, people who've gone through horrific things like losing a child or losing or having a child get really, really sick. I mean, that's every parent's worst nightmare. And yet, I am blessed that that has not been my personal thing I've known mm -hmm. people but losing partners it's it's hard it's yeah. really hard yeah definitely uh, thankfully I have not experienced that yet but I'm Thank sure I, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure I will and At that's some point, part of life yeah so. uh, yeah uh, I'd like to shift more into like your childhood a bit and, sure. and growing up in, in New York City, mm -hmm. which is a pretty cool place to grow up if you eventually become an artist. Especially in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're pretty lucky. Were there any artists um, that really captured 
your attention really captivated you at an early age being in New York City? Well, being in New York City wasn't the... It allowed me to go to the High School of Music and Art, which was, uh, for me, um, a godsend. Um, whether or not I went to all my classes, but I always went to art. And um, I had a teacher there who was somewhat of an abstract painter named Matthew Feynman, who taught me so much. Mm. Um, and I still refer to um, something he said when people talk to me about being blocked or um, having a hard time finding time to do their art is he said you need to be in the habit of art and it's really true I mean my son will tell you I'm not fun if I haven't been in my studio for a while mm -hmm. you really don't want to be around me um, and I think about Matthew Feynman and he was he was a fine artist who was teaching he was a really good teacher he had his favorites which wasn't so cool but um, but he was a really good teacher and he challenged us and uh, really looked at our work and he was a working artist and most of us have to have day jobs or other careers. I mean, mm. you know, I worked with young children for many, many years and families and I feel the work was worthwhile. I, you know, I do. Mm -hmm. So growing up in New York City, another thing was, you know, when I was coming home from high school, I could get off the subway. The museums were all free for students at the time. Oh, wow. I could get off the subway and go to the Museum of Modern Art. On, I'd get off at 59th Street and sit in the room with um, Gauguin paintings. On one side was, you know, the the forest and the other was the sleeping lion and I could just sit there and then walk through Georgia O'Keeffe and just everyone imaginable for me that was such a gift and I one of your questions was about is my family are there artists in my family and yeah yeah absolutely and um so my mother had a book called world famous paintings that I would love to um I just enjoyed looking at and uh, I just sit there for hours going through and and the paintings were plates so they were printed at mm. a higher quality than the book itself yeah and um, you know it was it was magical for me mm -hmm. uh, I lived as a young child in Coney Island which um, inspired some of my work I, I did a series of um, memories and dreams a while back mm. but um, I think living in New York I don't know that there were specific artists that I went to see it was just uh, available to me right. in a way that um, it's not available to someone even living in Berkeley, there's the Berkeley yeah. Art Museum, there's the Oakland Museum of, you know, it's, there, there are a few, but you have to really make an effort to get there. Right. I yeah. just got off the subway and I was at the Met. Yeah. You know, and everyone took the subway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember as a really young child going to the museum with my father, with my mother, you know, um, it was just something we did. Mm -hmm. And, um, I did have one famous artist in my family. Max Weber was my grandfather's cousin. And uh, my mother was an artist, really talented. She did not, um, she always said she had a flair. She was a fashion and textile designer. She was amazing. My grandmother wanted to be a costume designer. And uh, on my father's side, I just recently found out I had um, one of my Norwegian, my great great grandfather was a painter in Norway. And um, so, yeah, there have always been artists in my family. Um, but I think the hard thing was 
there was never the confidence that you could earn a living at art. There was mm. never... My mother was encouraging in me drawing, but not in trying to make a living at it. But when pushing... That's came, really interesting. Yeah. That your whole family is filled with artistic people, but but your mom was less supportive of it being a professional well, pursuit. Well, she was also a 50s bride, which is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but it's the women who got married and expected to stay home and raise their families mm -hmm. and be... Um, you Stay know, home father home. knows best kind yeah. of life. Mm -hmm. And um, Leave It to Beaver was a TV show. It was not life. And um, my grandparents were incredibly resilient. You know, they came as immigrants and they made their way. And my mother was incredibly strong and she took care of us and did everything she needed to do. But her plan was to stay home and take care of the kids and make pies and draw on the side. Mm -hmm. And she she did try for a little while and she earned some money as a, as a fashion designer, textile designer. But then she was gonna get married and so she became a bookkeeper. And then when she wasn't married anymore, she had to be a bookkeeper again because that wasn't, you know, when you have two kids, you don't, say I'm going to be an artist or at least yeah. she didn't you know so you worked in um, education and then also you you said that you were a graphic designer mm -hmm. was that hard for you do you think that's hard for artists in general to balance that day job with their art um, like how, how did you handle that um, be, having a job kind of like a nine to five or maybe it was like a part time at time where you have to you have to clock in clock out and then you also you're, you're coming in, you know, potentially exhausted, but you're still wanting to do this thing that you love. How did you, how did you manage that? Well, there's a few things. So, um, when I graduated from Pratt with my BFA in sculpture, my plan was to be a waitress and do my art on the side. That was my plan. Mm. There were no classes back then about how to get your work into galleries, or nor was I really ready to have my work in galleries. I moved to California <laughs> six months after I graduated and didn't have a kiln, didn't have a welding, you know, I didn't, I was drawing in black and white because I figured if I started painting that I'd be too obsessed to go to work. <laughs> and. Um, so I, I balanced it by thinking that sleep was um, optional. For a lot of years, I didn't get enough sleep, and mm -hmm. people used to laugh at how late I slept on the weekends. Mm -hmm. But first of all, that's my body. That's, you know, I'm a night person. But um, second of all, that I needed to catch up because I did. You know, I was a single parent. I was working full time plus and I was still making art and showing my work and um, it was hard and a couple of times it kind of broke me but I I need it. I have a wonderful niece named Shulamit who um, said to me when she was about 12, how did you get to be such a good artist? You know, she was 12. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, it's 10% talent, 10% training, and 80% need. You have to need it. Mm -hmm. If you don't need it, why bother? Mm -hmm. You know, I can do s sketches all the time, but why do I spend, you know, hundreds of hours working on my work, um, a lot of which is, you know, in my studio or the hallway. I need it. Mm -hmm. And I... I do understand the whole art for art's sake kind of mentality. I also really want people to see my work. Mm. I want to hear what they see, what they feel when they see my work. Right. Um, and that becomes its story to them, and it's 
fine. I don't need to. That's why it's hard to talk about my work. You know, it's hard to sure. explain it because yeah. I want people to see it and respond to it or not. Right. You know. Um, so I don't know if I answered the question or if I went off on a tangent, but. Um, I like your tangents. They're good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, no, there's so many directions we could go. Uh, yeah, you mentioned how you it broke you a couple times. Um, going a bit off of the, the questions I have, I'm curious, um, cause it sounds like you're pretty well read in psychology and, and that kind of stuff, and you're, it's, it seems to me, you know, we just met, but it se you seem very in touch with yourself. Uh, I don't know if that's always how you've been or if that took time to develop. But, uh, yeah, what did you, was there anything you did when, I mean, you're working a full-time plus job, you have a kid and you're low sleep, so, you know, you're cutting corners on your own health to, to pursue this, this art process. Uh, what, what did you do the, during those times? Can you, can you talk about what actually happened? Like, you just were burnt out and you just had to like I couldn't focus I, I couldn't focus I couldn't do what I was doing anymore and I needed to leave my job mm -hmm. or um, when I was a graphic designer I was the that's easier for me to talk to because it's it's not as it was 25 years ago 30 years ago okay um, I was working for a nonprofit as a graphic designer. And we moved from handwork, you know, cutting ruby lith and all that kind of stuff, doing the four color separation ourselves, mm -hmm. to computers. And so I was working on a learning curve, trying to learn the computer stuff mm -hmm. and produce the work that was needed for my organization. And I was working like 80 hours a week. And my, I started having problems with my hands and my shoulders. Mm. And it was before anyone knew anything about carpal tunnel. Oh, wow. And it was really early. Mm -hmm. And um, I was using a turbo mouse, so I was doing this all mm. the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I first went to the doctor, and they didn't, even, they didn't even diagnose me for six weeks or, you know, two months. And I did all the physical therapy, and I did the exercises, and I'm really rigorous about everything I'm doing, and I'm not getting better. Mm -hmm. And it took me four years to have surgery. I stopped painting. I stopped doing anything except working. It was oh, before wow. I had a child. And I, I ended up having to have surgery on both my hands, and despite the fact that it was great relief, I could not go back to that profession. So mm. I basically, I tried, and it didn't. I started getting the pain again, I was pregnant, it was not gonna work. Mm -hmm. So I moved into a different career, uh, back to education, but I really like doing graphics for nonprofits. Mm. You know, my work was out there all the time. I got positive feedback, which was nice. And mm -hmm. I know that lots of artists don't, you know, say that they don't care so much about what people think of their work. I do. Yeah. I, I do like positive feedback. And, and positive feedback on, on graphic work gives me more momentum to do my own work and not give a shit what people say right. me. Yeah. Um, not care. Yeah. You know, it, it just gives me freedom and it gives me financial freedom, mm -hmm. you know, which education, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. um, but, uh, and then more recently, I also, you know, put my work before myself and needed to step back and that's okay. Um, I go back and forth about it and now I'm in a much better place, but um, yeah, 
yeah, I don't really know what else to say. Yeah. No, it sounds like you, it was a long hiatus of four years of not really doing any art. And then getting back into it was a, a slow transition, or did you just jump, jump right back in? No. Yeah, it was not hard to go back to my own work. First yeah. of all, when you're working at a computer, you're, you're basically killing very small muscles. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing art, even if you're drawing and rendering, you're using your whole arm using your whole body. Yeah. I mean, when I'm painting, I'm sitting, I'm standing, I'm on the floor, I'm, you know, turning the canvas, whatever I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a different kind of uh, process. Um, I didn't have four years of not working. I was, I was working on a series of paintings and I stopped in the middle of the second painting. It was four paintings. I stopped in the middle and then, um, Twelve years later, I finished the series, which was, oh, wow. which was, it was really cool. Um, that must have been cathartic. It was. It was to finalize really it good. all. Yeah, um, but once I had the surgery, I was not in pain as much all the time. But once I went back to doing graphics, it was coming back, and I felt it. And yeah. I, I just needed longer to heal mm-hmm. than. And that's happened to me, you know, a few times. I need a little longer to heal than jobs can wait. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. That's okay. Different life. You you have a lot of uh, schools that you you went to. And I think it's so cool that you went to a... I'm kind of jealous. You went to a music and art high school. Uh, That's the high school of music art music and art in New York City. And then you went for your undergrad to the Rhode Island School of Design. And then you mentioned earlier, but um, a BFA in sculpture and minor in painting from the Pratt Institute in New York. Yeah. I'm just curious, were there any in uh, exercises that like really stood out to you during that time that were like really important for your development as an artist? Yeah, there were a few. Um... Yes, I was very lucky to go to Music and Art, which is now the High School of the Arts, the Fiorello H. LaGuardia High School of the Arts. It combined with its sister school, um, which was Performing Arts, which is what fame was written about. Okay. So now it's there in Lincoln Center instead of Castle up in Harlem. Mm. Um, but I, I think from college, there were I had a teacher named Dave Brisson, who, RISD was not a great fit for me, but um, he was an amazing teacher. He was a, a 2D design, 2D color and design, and he had worked with Hans Hoffman, who is a color theorist. Mm-hmm. And he was a science, you know, he talked about science and art. And he um, he talked about things that, art-wise made me think. Um, Most of high school, not so much the art classes, but in general, you eat the material and then you spit it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I left his classroom crying because he challenged me in ways that I had never imagined. Um, And I think it's really important to allow yourself to think outside of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes I say, well, you know, if you want to explain to me about how the aurora borealis happens, I'm like, you know, it's magic, it's okay. Yeah. But there are some ways that we need to continue to challenge ourselves mm-hmm. mentally. And he did. And he, you know, he, I remember lessons, things that he did. And then there was this sculptor, sculpture teacher at Pratt. Mm-hmm named Toshio Date, and he is still alive, and I recently got his book. I was just so thrilled that he was still okay. Um, there was another teacher, Mike Melpass, who taught me to weld, and that was huge. But um, Toshio Date was a really amazing carver, and he was a Japanese, you know, he, his techniques were incredible. Mm. And we 
part of our core classes was to take this wood class. We had to build uh, something big with only hand tools. You know, once you've used power tools, you don't really necessarily, well, some people do want to go back to hand tools. But mm. um, I built a settler's rocker and then I had him for another class and I was working on, I was doing these plaster sheet. I took canvas and embedded in plaster and folded it over um, armatures that were fairly abstract but they became cloaks as I said cloaks have been yeah. and I was creating these worlds of you know really outside of what anyone else was nobody else was doing what I was doing mm -hmm. and he said he said to me and it just was so moving to me he said some people are going to go along the path and sometimes go a little further and he said I'm going to give you a machete. You're going through the woods. <laughs> and I was, I felt so seen. Yeah. You know, I felt so seen. And um, a lot of times in my life, um, people have said, well, why don't you just focus on just one thing and you'll go further? And mm -hmm. I don't think the Renaissance artist focused just on one thing. I think... And many artists, you know, work both in sculpture and in painting and, of course, drew, which is, for me, the basis of so many things. Mm. It's just like breathing to me. It's core. So this idea that I, I need to just keep doing the same thing, I don't want to do that. I, when I was 12 and I learned to throw pots, I realized I love great ceramics. I love amazingly beautifully thrown pieces. Mm -hmm. It's not what I want to do. I don't want to do more than one of something. Sorry. It's okay. She's okay. <laughs> he, she, I don't know. More um, ambiguous. Yeah. Uh... So, Man, there's so there's yeah. I mean, that's just uh, so much time to be spending in in uh, in art school. I mean, there's you probably learned so many things, uh, and then over the. I also learned that if you have a drawing teacher or a painting teacher, most of the time, if they have a very specific style, you have to do one piece in their style, and mm -hmm. then they let you go. They let you do what you want. Yeah. But they have an idea that you need to do line drawings, and so you need to do one really good line drawing, and then they will let you do whatever you want. Yeah. So it, it wasn't a very structured curriculum. It was in the it, sense that you needed to check certain boxes, but then after that, they kind of let you explore and they kind of keep an eye on you. Some, but it was also art school in the 70s, and so they had their ideas of what was good and what was not. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. As I said, I've always been a narrative artist, and you know, we were asked to bring our work into a painting class, work that we were doing outside of class, and I brought in a series of drawings relating to a, a fire I had had, mm -hmm. um, and some other things. And it was, and I put them up, and people said, well, they're just illustrations. Mm -hmm. And that was meant as an insult. Yeah. And I, if, if you didn't fit into their idea of what was good, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't always so popular. Right. And that can be, you know... It can be hard, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't. I didn't always walk to the same drummer as the other people. So mm -hmm. That's okay. And that's what artists are, though, right? Doing doing what they want to do, exploring yeah. their own their own stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to move now to uh, your creative process, and particularly this uh, photo that I saw. 
right. on your website of different. Uh, it's the same sunflower, but right. but done uh, one in like ink and another in water color and another in a stronger water color. Right. Um, and you could reference this or not, but I kind of just this is this stood out to me as like, oh, okay, this is probably a key part of uh, her creative process. Can you walk us through um, stuff like? Do you start with an idea or do you start with a medium? Kind well, of going back to what you were saying earlier with the content drives the medium or, or, or vice versa. Well, with this particular piece, um, I was driven by what was going on in Ukraine. Um, and I wanted to create something that was marketable as prints to raise money for UNICEF. That was my plan. Okay. Um, so... Before I did any of these, I studied the pattern of the seeds of sunflowers, you know, the flower of life pattern and some like that. And I spent a lot of time trying to understand what the seed pattern is mm -hmm. in a sunflower. And I didn't totally grasp it, but I got to a point where I understood it enough that I could minimize it to the point of feeling comfortable that it would read the way I wanted it to read. Right, yeah. And um, so I did a lot of drawings and looked at a lot of seed patterns of sunflowers mm -hmm. and um, petal patterns of sunflowers because I don't do a lot of flower paintings. Mm -hmm. I do a few, but not a lot. So I did the sketch and then I... I think I did I think I did this one first. Oh, interesting. You started maybe, with the watercolor. Uh that's ink and watercolor. Oh, I see. I don't re I think I did maybe this one first, the ink first. Mm -hmm. And then I did the ink I This is uh something called Upo paper and it's translucent. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't put it over the original, but I put it over that and did the ink part of that and then worked into it with watercolors but i really wasn't happy with it and so i did the pure watercolor because i felt it was more uh powerful and closer to what i wanted actually those two are sold the originals oh, really? yeah yeah um i just sold them i really like the vibrant blue down here thank you and the and the golden the golden yellow of the sunflower. I think that looks just magical. Thank you. Yeah. I, I sold some I sold some of the prints. I put some up in my window, but mostly it was people I saw. With them. I did see those yeah. the first thing I saw. I was, oh, that's what I'm going to be talking it's, about. Uh, I put them up on Instagram and on Facebook, and some people called me. And originally I was going to sell them and collect the money and send it all to UNICEF at once, but mm. it wasn't... It. I think a lot of people were trying to raise money for Ukraine at that time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I sold some and I just told people, here's the print, send, you know, $50 to UNICEF. Mm -hmm. And so they sent it directly to them. So it wasn't really the way I'd originally envisioned it, but UNICEF got some money from it and people were happy with them. And so that's good mm -hmm. for me. That's my um, anyway. Yeah. How do you get your ideas? Does it start with an idea? Or, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, sometimes it starts with a specific idea or a dream or a memory mm. or something that happens to me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the emptiness one, it was after the death of my partner and uh, it was just needed to be painted mm -hmm. and um, with the Chasm series with social distance it's very this is done in 2020 so it's fairly obvious um, where that came from and then right. the Chasm which is behind me is um, I just I and by political, we're all political. We're all products of politics. We, you can't not be political at all. 
you know, mm -hmm. you're affected by politics. Your daily life is affected. And the chasm between left and right, white and black, and all the things in between, all the ways that we can be separated seem to be growing wider and wider. And um, the separation of people, I don't know if it increased that or the election of Trump increased it to the point where it was, you know, it was just becoming so overwhelming and so hard to imagine. So I, I started, I'm, I'm not a super politically active person. I go to some marches, I send some money, I sign some petitions, I, but I'm not, I'm not a mover and a shaker. Mm -hmm. But this oh, is probably one of my more political pieces was this chasm and then moving into here where they're trying to build the bridge um, but there's no buttresses. There's nothing holding it up. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as I said, this one where it's sort of an inner view, a, a, a world of what are you going to choose to do? Are you going to make your peace with the world as it is? Or are you going to try and move forward and move towards the light? And um, the diptych, which is behind you, was a continuation of that which is um, some people trying to make their way out, some people trying to, you know, making their peace, and some people falling, some people not making their way out. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I have the next six, they're planned out, but um, I don't know if, what they're gonna be like when I do them. You know, I just started two yesterday, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. So, so this started with an idea, um, but like that piece over there, that's a memory. I grew up in Coney Island, um, and my best friend lived next door to me, mm -hmm. and we, um, the interactions of the rest of the world were sort of nondescript to us we were each other's world right and um and the boardwalk plays a predominant role in in some of my pieces uh so that was and because it's it's on that piece is on plexiglass and it's layered it's painted on both sides of the plexiglass and layered with epoxy and painted on top of the epoxy so it it takes on its own life, and somehow it, that piece got some sort of crackle thing in there that I love, and I can't reproduce it because mm. I don't know what I did. That's some of the spontaneity coming yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Exactly. No doubt. To you as the artist, I know you like to keep it open yeah. for people to interpret their yeah. own, but for yeah. you, I'm curious, what, what do these people on top who have made it out and are dancing and greeting each other what are what do they represent um acceptance uh of the world optimism i think i i think that i was moving to a place where i was trying to see the sunshine you can actually see the sunshine hitting some of them Mm. and not so much inside yeah they're literally outside yeah <laughs> they're literally outside yeah yeah but they're they can't necessarily reach the other side of the chasm the question is is there is there still a chasm will there always be that break mm -hmm. so yeah that's I mean, we did start unmasking, and we did start, um, you know, from a from that point of view. But politically, I'm still not sure if there's a bridge, if there will be a bridge. I'd like to move into the the Instagram segment now. Sure. If that's good with you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a, a new thing 
My legs falling asleep. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can stand up and walk around. Oh no, I'm I'm okay. Um, are you, are you doing good? Yeah. You want? To, yeah. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, let's just start. I'll just hand you the the iPad here, and you can just go on some of the maybe like I think because of the time, maybe two or three, depending on on how how long you want to talk okay. about them. Uh, okay. For a couple minutes each and okay. just talk about like what you like and uh if they're underrated to you okay in any way i'm picking out my three who are i don't think as well known as some of you know i think david kassan is amazing but he's pretty go. well known okay so um baby move your foot So um, one of my favorite artists on Instagram is uh, Rima Day. It's a woman, I believe. Um, I don't know what pronouns they use, so I'll say they. They do, um, their art is mostly uh, embroidery and thread work on white sheer fabric. And for me, it's incredibly moving to see these expressive pieces done in a medium that has been traditionally woman's work, mm. a craft. Um, Do you mind if I scroll through? Oh, please. Her, uh, their work is amazing. It just blows me away. It's expressive and simple at the same time. It's clean, yet it holds so much. Um, I don't know why. Uh, when I was a sculpture major at Pratt, my senior project was a three-dimensional book of fabric art pieces, and it was totally dismissed. Mm. Part of the reason I did it was I wanted people to have to touch it in order to see it. And um, kind of like Brancusi's Sculptures for the Blind, and uh, her work takes this to a whole nother level. Yeah. Um, and it is so beautifully done and created, and um, it just blows me away. They blow me away. Um, so this is all in fabric. Yeah. I mean, wow. I think there is some drawing in there, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they created that piece, which is oh, like wow. a heart. That's um, awesome. There's a, a woman named Selena Pete who I'm friends with, and and she also works in fabric and does beautiful work. But um, Rima, I'm I'm not sure Nashville. if it's Rima or Emi because I have. I used to have a sister-in-law named Amy, and there was an R at the beginning. I'm not sure how to pronounce their name. Mm, Rima Day. And and I love stories, I, and they are stories. They're incredible, just mm. incredibly. And I do think craftsmanship really matters. I do. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Um, otherwise, you people can't hear you. Awesome. The next one, I'm gonna. So, this guy's name, this person's name is Misha, and the tag is Cash Mesh, and they are. Uh, a fine artist who work with uh, different models and different themes and they are so 
open and free and yet specific mm. and their work every piece tells a story to me mm. and I every time I see their work I'm just like they are they're young too they're they're very young well I don't know how young but they they have such fluidity and confidence in their work and that's something that sometimes I run back to rendering because it's my safe space mm -hmm. and they're they're not doing that and they're going from extreme perspectives to not extreme perspectives and they're drawing everyone um, I did a series of sculptures that were all female torsos and big, small, one breast, two breasts, you know, everyone. Mm -hmm. And I just, lo I love their work. Yeah, we're very kinetic. Yeah. Lots of movement. Yeah. And even in their pastels and paintings, you can see that intensity. And, and mm -hmm. Wow, I really like that one. Yeah, That's nice. right? Are these just artists that you found uh, through the explore page, or uh, not the through? explore page? I don't, I don't remember how I found Rima Day or mm. Keshmesh, but mm. the last person that I'm going to show you is mm. a man named Charlie Hunter, okay. and I had seen his work. I don't know how long ago. Mm -hmm. All right. So Charlie Hunter is a painter and lives in the Northeast. And I first saw his work because he also used to, I don't know if he still organizes these train rides with different singer songwriters. And I also like narrative songs. I'm a big Dave Alvin fan and, you know, people like that who tell a story. Mm -hmm. And his work is um, spiritual and somewhat narrative he he works most of them are landscapes or uh old machines and tractors and trailers he lives mm -hmm. in the northeast someplace cold like i don't know if it's maine or vermont or i think vermont and he's incredible he's magic he is magic and he gives classes online i don't I don't know, I, I tend to sort of stray away from classes, even if I really like the work of the person because I don't really like people telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. So um, You've had so much of that already, yeah. with all your education. Well, yeah, I mean, um, so I just, uh, his work is amazing. It's yeah. just incredible. So those, so I knew of Charlie Hunter before I knew of Instagram from the, I forget what it's called, Roots on Rails or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw his work and I, I think I wrote to him or, I don't know, just, he takes the ordinary and, and touches it to become extraordinary. It is... Uh, inspiring and so okay let's go to your Instagram now okay let me see I should be able to find it through here yeah awesome so yeah what are you up to nowadays is I know you mentioned you're transitioning into the continuation of this mural, but maybe none of that's posted yet. No, no, none of it's posted. We have the, uh, for people who are curious of this, <laughs> the dog sound in the background, this is the doggy <laughs> who's uh, making a guest appearance on the show. The first, the first dog to ever be on the series here. Exciting. Okay. So um, I have a, a show up at a place called Piedmont Gardens, and that's what this one is. It's a little series of 
watercolors and uh, you can't see all of the pieces but um, these are these are the musical moments um, you can't see it that well there but um, this is my best friend BFF for forever and ever mm. and um, this was uh, God, Booker T who I saw at the freight and um, he just amazing blues musician R&B um, and I had to paint him mm. and then this one which is cut off you can see it in the in the feed by itself it was another blues musician and piano player and uh, this was this actually that's cool changed um i did several sketches at a live show at a place called the sound room in oakland and uh i i sketched the person there but then i brought it home and decided he needed to have a mustache and um, <laughs> so it became something else and that's fine mm -hmm. uh this one which i think maybe yeah this one nice. um I started out wow. doing it. It's very small. It's uh, like four by six, mm -hmm. and um, it's in watercolors. Though it's not. I didn't use the watercolors like watercolors. I used them more like wash. And I said it doesn't really matter because I can use them however I want. And um, it was a it was a show. I think um, I don't remember. I'm not going to say the wrong name, but mm -hmm. he. Uh, he just was jamming, and I sketched him, and then I came home and painted him, and uh, someone on Instagram ordered a print, a, like 18 by 24 print, and I thought, that's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. But I figured, okay, I'll spend the money, I'll get it done. It worked really well, but then she ghosted me, so there you go. Oh. Um, but this is, you know, I like this, and this was actually before I called it a series, before I called it Musical Moments, this mm -hmm. is just, called guitar person or guitar yeah. man or something like that it almost looks like an oil painting at first glance because it, it's so rich in yeah, color yeah but i was working with watercolors but i yeah. i was not making them translucent or like that that piece is on plexiglass and that's yeah. also a multi plexiglass piece and it um I did a drawing and an ink drawing and an ink and graphite drawing of the same image and a watercolor of the same image. And it was, I called it meditation for a while. And then someone on Facebook said, it looks like the stone people. And I looked up the stone people and I was like, yeah. It's the stone people. Mm. If you want to know about the stone people, you should look it up because okay. it's really fascinating. And um, then somebody recently told me it was the Supreme Court. So there you go. Mm. I love hearing what people say. Yeah. You know, what they see. Um, and then um, more of the musical moments. Uh, that one is oh, Dave wow. Alvin, my all time favorite musician. Nice. I gave it to him. I hope he liked it. Um, this is that work you were talking about earlier as well. Yeah. The mustaches. Yeah. And then the these my more raw uh, images. It just happens sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, How long did this one take you? Mm, I was working on this one and the one after it. Uh, at the same time, it took me about a week of working on it and leaving it and going back to it. Mm. Mm. This one, this one was sold. This was uh, uh, an incredible group called Numbotu, Numbuntu, and they're an a cappella African women group. And my sister-in-law and brother-in-law got us tickets for it, and I was like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't know." I went there. I was blown away. They were so amazing. Mm. And um, I sat there and sketched them, and then combined it, and I added the watercolor, and I looked at it, and I said, "This figure's too far away." And yeah. I redid the whole thing. <laughs> so, oh wow! 
This wasn't based off a photo. This was a free no. sketch there. That was from sketching. Wow. Yeah. I sketched the individual pieces, you know, mm -hmm. and then brought them together. See, like these, I mean, I saw a piece of driftwood, and that's what the inspiration was. Mm -hmm. And the, behind it, before I put the branch on there, I had done some experimenting with some watercolors and... Uh, um, uh, dishwash detergent sprayed on it. Oh, wow. Um, and I wasn't, you know, I just stuck it in the back of a yeah. pile of drawings. And um, and then when I saw this, I thought, well, yeah, that's what I want. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't help but notice all the driftwood over there. Earlier. Oh, that's my son. My son's a carpenter. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's a really talented uh, artist also. Continuing the, yeah. the creativity in the family. So I draw, as I said, I draw like I breathe. And so, like, things like this, I was in a waiting room waiting, and so I drew that. Yeah. So, and uh, this was a um, show I was in, excellent gallery in downtown Oakland, called Uma Gallery, and... Uh, That's your most recent, correct? No. The one that... Uh, oh, no, you had another one after that in December, January. Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, I, I think I had, two, I had two pieces in different shows at Uma, and um, then I had uh, the show at the Sound Room, and then the show at Piedmont Gardens, and... I have work at the law library and so forth. So Spooked was before the other one. And then... This one stood out to me. This is actually one of my favorite pieces of yours. Thank of you. The visit. Um, it... The way that the colors kind of bleed into each other makes it seem like I'm looking at a memory in my own mind, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. Yeah. Did, was this based on off of a specific experience you had or more of the idea of, of visiting someone? Well, I think that people who are gone visit you in your dreams. I believe that. Mm. And, um, and you can also visit memories in your dreams. Your dreams are, are made for that. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I had gone out to one of the Northern California beaches, which are very different than the East Coast beaches. And I had taken a photo or done a sketch, I don't remember. And then I just started, um, I had liked the parallels. And um, I just, my shadow was in there. There wasn't another person. Mm -hmm. um, and that just sort of happened that way. Oh, fascinating. This is your shadow? One, one this was meant to be your shadow? Well, it, it, it's not meant to be my shadow, oh, okay. but my shadow was in the photo oh, I, oh, I oh, took. Okay. I see. And so it became this, which is that same friend. My Oh, yeah. My first friend, Leslie. She lives in Bali. Oh. Nice. Fantastic. And like this one. This one, not so easy f for people to look at, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any other ones that you want to speak to before we move on? Mm, I don't know. Let's see. There's a lot of stuff up there. There is. That's my logo. Because I am the dichotomy of life. Um, I like to experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go further back, all right, this one is in the hallway now. That was done with a different technique. That's Fire 9, I think it is. It was in a show recently, maybe a year or two ago. And uh, it won first place, which made me feel really good. Yeah. Um, it's a big piece. It's three feet by three feet. So it's, okay. you know, fairly large. Yeah, that's big for you. And uh, 
it was part of this fire series, which I started. I had done a, a short series based on mm, my mother and father meeting kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Very specific, not not totally loose brushwork, mm -hmm. but it's up at the law library right now. At that oh cool those three paintings, but um, so I was like. But it was pretty specific, mm -hmm. and so I just wanted to play with color. So I yeah. started doing that and using different things to spread the paint and so forth. And I started doing the fire series, and there are eleven in the fire series now. But mm -hmm. this was Fire Nine, which was a, like a dying of the fire, like the. And then there's one that's embers right after that. I, yeah, I don't know if that series is totally finished, but. Well, there's so much for people who are interested. They can just do a, yeah, a super deep dive into your yeah. Instagram. It almost seems like there's, there's some here that aren't on your website. There are, there are, yeah. because it's very easy for me to post on Instagram and not so easy for me to put them up on the website. Right, yeah. But you can't order Instagram. You can't, like, reorder the images. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that. There might be a way. But... To reorder them on your feed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's kind of stuck yeah. in the way so that the order So you can't is group things. You can't say this is this series, this is that series. Like, I have several um, Windows, my Windows series. So this mm -hmm. is um, Mendocino Woodlands. It mm -hmm. was one of the first of the series, and it's a place I go every summer with an incredible group of friends. And um, when one of the people who went there said was here, and they they bought prints of it, and they said it's kind, you made it kind of magical. And I said, well, like, everyone knows it's magical, mm -hmm. you know. This one did stand out to me, also actually, and I know it's. Uh, one of your more recent works. Is there a story behind this or it's just you just wanted to capture the place for it being a place that you go to? Well, we've year? been going for almost 40 years. So it's a group of, it's my friends from when I was young and stupid and single and now I'm just stupid and single. So, <laughs> um, um, and I, I just, I have painted up there other times and I just I was okay so what happened was we were doing some work in the back house and we pulled out a window and I said I want to paint on this window which started me painting on glass and painting on plexiglass but mm -hmm. then I realized I wanted to do a series of people looking through windows and seeing something and so these windows the the idea was to create a room and yeah. I have, I have four, four pieces, and I really wanted to have one room with four walls and have one window on each wall. But it didn't happen that way as far as showing them. Like the only one that's got the inside in the piece is the home one, which is in the hallway, and that's got the plants in the front. Mm. But this is just it's it's a place to go. It's. It's the security of, of, and protection of being in a home, in a house, in a cabin, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the unlimited uh, beauty and exploration and um, everything of what's beyond and the danger and the difficulty. It's that same dichotomy of like you can go beyond but you have the security of inside also. Oh, wow. It's like the cloak. My cloaks also represent the idea of hiding and security and keeping to oneself, mm -hmm. but you can open and reveal them and you don't know what's gonna happen. It could be great, it could be not. I know, I know you don't, uh, I know you like to keep it open to interpretation, but you could honestly write a book about some of these works and, and unpack your, your meanings, because I think they're really beautiful and spot on, and they're things that didn't immediately come to me when, when, until you say them, and then they make a lot more sense. Thank you.
but um, yeah, that was another work that really stood up to me. I'm not really uh, much of a writer. I, I can, I can dictate, <laughs> but mm. I'm not. Uh, I never thought of myself as much of a writer. Mm. Um, though I, I occasionally write. You could, you could do it. <laughs> uh, okay, great. I want to transition now to like uh, some questions for for like other artists, kind of like advice type questions sure. that, that you might want to give. Um, what's something every artist should try at least once? Um, I thought about this because you had sent me this question, and I think every artist should try to draw with their opposite, their non-dominant hand. Um, I'm left-handed. And it's a right-handed world, and I think I'm somewhat ambidextrous. And when I had surgery, the initial carpal tunnel surgery, um, I started drawing with my right hand. And the first were really loose because I had no expectations, which was great. And then I realized yeah. I can draw with my right hand. Yeah. But that's partly because I'm somewhat ambidextrous. One of the joys of doing something that forces you to step outside of your expectations, mm -hmm. like drawing with the opposing hand, using a medium you've never used before, using a medium that does something that you can't control, is that it allows you to let go of some of the expectations and some of the tightness. Yeah. And so, I think that's really important. It's, you know, I come back to my early childhood education, the power of play, the, mm -hmm. you gotta be able to let go, you know, and, and for me, that's an important thing in all my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great way to, for an artist to challenge themselves. Um, what's an uncommon tool that you use every day or it could be close to every day that would be hard to live without an uncommon tool uncommon tool well i don't use it every day but i use socks when i paint sometimes interesting like on your hand no i i hit the paint oh you hit the paint <laughs> okay i was really needed to let some stuff out when I started that fire series and and even before then I started doing this thing where I would spread the paint by hitting it mm. and it's somewhat uncontrollable it's that combination and sometimes I would tape off areas or you know mask areas mm -hmm. that I didn't want it to spread right but within it within where it's spreading it does things that is you can touch it up with a brush but mm. you can't create it with a brush every mm -hmm. every tool that you use when you're working has its own fingerprints mm -hmm. and i particularly like that yeah you know i use that and i uh i use a spray can sometimes when I'm, with terpenoid in it when i'm working on things like that oh interesting this is a very straightforward question. Uh, what is a what is the best purchase you've made under a hundred dollars in the last year? I was trying to think of it because I usually I very rarely spend more than a hundred dollars. Sure. Um, so uh, I found a really cool lamp that I'm excited about to clean it. It's um, it's a brass urn, it uh, copper urn. Mm -hmm. made into a lamp and my grandfather um, who was amazing um, made lamps mm -hmm. and he um, he helped me to make a lamp out of one of my clay sculptures once and it got broken but this it's just a, it's an urn like a coffee urn a mm -hmm. copper coffee urn and I found it so now I need to find a shade it works and clean it up a little, but I, I don't mind it being somewhat tarnished. I, mm -hmm. I really don't. I don't necessarily need it, but I like it. It's just cool. I mm -hmm. just like it. Um, so I, I would say that that's, I'm excited about that. Um, I, 
I um, I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't buy a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I buy um, I don't like shopping, so I shop more online than I should. But um, I buy art supplies. I buy clothes for myself. I buy. Like an extravagance is, you know, some of the amazing mushrooms at Berkeley Bowl or something like that. You know? Yeah, those can <laughs> those, get up there yeah. in the dry goods section. Yeah, I, I saw this. Yeah, serious. And um, so I, I, I don't really. I'm not a. I buy gifts, you know. Um, the the last gift I gave was a wedding gift, and I gave one of a, a painting which was much appreciated which made me feel good but um i don't know i, I can't i couldn't really i saw that question and i couldn't really think of anything that i bought that was so spectacular sure you know but yeah. finding that lamp was was exciting and same day i found a really beautiful rock so you know it's just i noticed that you collected gemstones yeah i'm also a big fan of of stones and crystals my yeah. my partner um had uh the mining rights to a, a rose quartz uh claim wow and that's phenomenal he, yeah we would go up there and and take some of the rose quartz back and um he had some gold mines, and we had one together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was interesting, different, very different world. You know, you were asking about living in New York City earlier, and I mm -hmm. was when I had seen that question. The first thing that came to mind was that New York is filled with people, and almost all of my work relates to people in some way or another, mm -hmm. because I lived in cities. I didn't live in the country right and um, even my landscapes were you know bodies and, and so forth mm -hmm. and then um, with this partner and going to these mining claims and down down to Central Valley um, it sort of opened up my work in a different way I've always wondered what it would be like to live in the country. What would happen to my work? That was, that was my biggest question. Yeah. It's like, what would happen? Yeah. So, it would change for sure, yeah. I, I would think. Yeah, I would think so. so. Um, let's see here. If you could have lunch with one artist, dead or alive, who would it be? Well, I have to say Frida Kala because... I don't know that I talked to her about painting techniques or anything like that. Mm -hmm. She was so resilient. She had so many things going on. So much pain and loss. Mm. And, you know, domination and so many things. I just, I don't know that I jump into asking her questions about that mm -hmm. but I just wonder what she was like as a person you know was she warm was she um, you know so many of her self portraits and so many of her paintings are self portraits mm -hmm. um, there's that famous one of her that, yeah that's seen everywhere yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I just wonder what she was like as a person. She's so stoic. In the kitchen is a painting of my mother sort of over a table with my sister sitting on one side and me sitting on the other side and my father off in the background and my mother's face is so stoic. Mm -hmm. um, and her face is always so unreadable yeah and yet compelling there's something so compelling mm -hmm. 
I remember going with my son when he was much younger to an exhibit of her work and him saying to me, you know, something about a baby and something about a loss and, and his interpretations of her work. And um, I don't know, I just would like to, maybe I should read a biography or something, but, mm -hmm. um, but to see what she was like as a person, you know. Interesting, yeah. So you have you haven't read much up on her actual life story, but just her works. I know speaks a to little you. bit of her relationship with Diego Rivera, mm -hmm. um, but no, I haven't. Um, I love to read, but I read really slowly, mm -hmm. and um, there's lots of books I should read that I haven't. Yeah. What advice would you give to the 20 something artist who's just just starting out? Believe in yourself, but don't be cocky. Um, I think that lack of self-confidence in my work was a real, really hard thing for me. Mm. Um, and I know my work is good. It doesn't mean I don't have moments of total self-doubt about why am I bothering doing all this. Right. But um, to be able to present, you know, to take the advice of people who are showing in galleries and, and to not be afraid or be afraid and, and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, to approach galleries and so forth. It's something I've struggled with my whole life. Yeah. And um, just to believe in yourself and, you know, it, it sounds very cliched, but to follow your heart. Mm -hmm. um, you always have to make a living, but there's a million ways to make a living. Right, yeah. There's a million ways to make a living. Yeah. And if you have to, you, you, will, make, you will make sure there's food on the table. Mm -hmm. And if you have a child, you will take care of that child. But if you need to make art, then believe in your art, believe in yourself. I, you know, easier said than done. Sure. I have to say. Yeah. But, um, but that's what I would say to, you know, to young people. And there's, it's never, there's never a moment. It's, you know, people talk about ballet dancers. They're they're never going to be able to be professional if they didn't start dancing till they were, you know, 12 or something. Mm -hmm. But I also have heard that about languages. If you don't learn languages when you're young, if you have the gift, you will learn it later if you're if you're open and ready for it. My sister didn't start taking language till she was 12. She spoke French. She uh, taught herself Russian. She learned Japanese. She went to Italy for two weeks and was speaking Italian. Wow. And she lives in Israel and is, speaks he Hebrew. And she says she's not a linguist because she's not really fluent in all these languages. Mm. Really impressive. I speak toddler. That's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. Yeah. So if you... Um, and I'm, I, and I, I'm not saying, I think that a lot of people were shut down in art and a lot of people, you know, my mother said, you can't be an artist or a secretary. And I, I said, okay, if I don't get into the best art school in the country, I'm not going to art school. I only apply to art schools. Who was mm -hmm. I kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but the truth is that if, if you f need it, I have a friend who's really talented and she was a dancer before she was a painter and she's, mm -hmm. she's really talented and she didn't really start till she was like 19 or 20 and I know people who started even later in life. Mm -hmm. If you can be open to it, you can do it. But someone who in their 20s who has that desire, who has that drive, they need, because confidence and competence build on each other. Mm -hmm. and they need to be able to help themselves in that way. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think self-reliance is really important and believing in yourself. Yeah, as cliche as it sounds, is very yeah, important. It really is. Yeah. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Isn't right. Right? Just have a few more questions here. Um, you mentioned earlier about how, you know, some, some beliefs uh, that you have about your dreams. Can you kind of elaborate more on that? Like, what is your relationship with your dreams and how does that influence your art practice? I had a dream when I was 12 that changed my way of thinking about life and death. I, um, and I didn't know anything about Eastern mysticism or anything, reincarnation or anything like that. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole dream, but I think dreams are really powerful. And uh, I've painted some dreams sometimes to get it out of my system and sometimes just because the process is a way of working through it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they're fascinating. Sometimes maybe not so much to other people. Mm. Um, they say they say your dreams are either your hopes or your fears. Um, I had a fantasy that if you could meet someone in your dream, you could allow them into your dream. You could do whatever you wanted together. Because you can fly in dreams, right? Mm -hmm. So if you and your best friend want to go someplace and you can't really go, you can meet in a dream and go, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I think dreams have influenced my work because I don't always want to live in this dimension. Um, I think I think dreams allow you to face your fears or at least um, see them and sometimes understand things you didn't understand before because you're making those associations in another part of your mind that is not accessible when you're awake and trying to do the laundry and trying to clean up the house or whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. Your dreams have the ability to ac access parts of yourself and parts of your mind that, like, like I was saying about the confidence before, in a dream you can have confidence. It's part of you. Mm -hmm. It's part of who you are. The belief in your artwork or your dreams of becoming a writer or whatever it is. In a dream you don't, you might question things that you didn't realize you were questioning, but your core beliefs are usually there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. My dreams teach me about myself what I'm obsessing about or focusing on yeah. or what's underneath what I'm obsessing about or focusing on. Mm. I always thought how cool it would be to be able to lucid dream on a consistent basis mm -hmm. for yeah. any type of creative thing. Yeah. And this might be like my workaholic-ish tendencies coming out, but it's like then I could do creative work in my dreams. I could be painting ideas and thinking of things in my dreams. Uh, have you lucid dreamt much or had many experiences where you became aware that you were dreaming in the dream or has it always been kind of this a few yeah a few and I'm told I talk in my sleep I know I talk in my sleep mm. and sometimes I'm aware of talking and I have no way of stopping myself oh wow well. and Um, yeah, there have been times, and I, I had, um, several times in my life I've had repetitive dreams, mm. um, which are generally not pleasant dreams, you know, mm. and, um, I did learn a technique of lucid dreaming, of 
recognizing that same dream and changing the ending. Changing it somehow. And it was successful with one, at least. But um, not often. I go through phases of remembering my dreams and sometimes when they wake me up, writing them down or not. Um, sometimes sketching them out. Not in the middle of the night, though, because that's too uh, invigorating for me to start sure. drawing night. Yeah. yeah, that would be hard. Yeah, that. But, yeah, I, I have quite a few paintings that are related to dreams that are usually not pleasant. Mm. One looks very pleasant, looks very... But it's... Uh, I did a whole series on dreams and memories, so... Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, is it on your website? In a uh, not not as a separate category. Oh, okay. But um, I can show you some of them. Okay. Yeah, I can I can link to those. A mother is this is a hypothetical for you. A mother is teaching her son about art one hundred years from now, and your name and some of your works come up in the in the history book that they're looking at together. Uh, what description of yourself? and your art would be most satisfying to you? That I touched people's hearts. That my work was authentic and touching and um, somehow people could relate to it in a way that was, um, I don't know the right word for it, from the gut. Mm. I don't mean gut-wrenching. I mean... I have a friend who has one of my paintings. She bought it. I let her buy it because I needed the money and, um, mm -hmm. instead of giving it to her. And um, she refers to the painting as her. She talks to the painting. And um, and that's powerful to me. That's that's getting into her soul, and that's what I want. I want people to look at some of my work and say, "That's how I felt," or "That makes sense." That that touches me in a way that I haven't felt before, or, mm. I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, that's why I love hearing people's reactions to my work. That's why I don't write big descriptions of, a lot of my work is called, right. you know, chasm. <laughs> very pretty. Very open-ended. Puppy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Final question for you. Uh, if you could choose one piece of art for every human on earth to spend alone in a room with, like let's say for an hour, uh, what what piece would you choose and why? That's really hard. You mean in all of art history? That's really hard. Part of me goes to someone like da Vinci um, because he was such a master and so complex. But then some, you know, another part of me goes to someone like Rousseau, where you can just fall into his paintings and, and live there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and then part of me, you know, goes to someone abstract like de Kooning whose work is just so compelling and you don't understand why and he's just what Dave Brisson said about order, chaos and confusion of like uh, it's the, there, you know there's a pattern but you don't know how yeah. how you know you just have to like find your way through it mm -hmm. you know um, so I can't really answer your question there's so many amazing artists today and in the years past 
we learn from them without even realizing it by seeing and absorbing their work through everyday life. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there are very few photographers whose work blows, you know, blows me away. Mm-hmm. Um, but some people are magic with a camera. You know, I have one friend who work just blows me away and um, I don't know why mm-hmm. so I, I can't really choose one piece it's like saying choose one food yeah you know, it's, like ice it's hard cream. yeah salad <laughs> all good in their own way yeah yeah exactly not all, all good I do believe that some some work I, I just don't want to spend time with mm my own and other people's. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's subjective. And I know it's, you know, you're not supposed to say something isn't good, but, you know, everyone can... I, I think people should have opinions and can have opinions as long as they don't impose them on other people. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's fine. Well, thank you for taking the time again. Uh, any any final final things you want to say? Thank you. I'm honored to be part of your your series and your. I I look forward to seeing the other artists as well. I've only seen a couple of them so far, so correct. I'm looking forward to seeing. We're just getting the ball rolling on yeah. on the show. So, uh, for people who are interested uh, to connect with you online. Uh, do you mind just going through where people can find you? Sure, sure. Um, Instagram is Ruth P S underscore Arts. It's R U T H P S underscore A R T S on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is Ruth Shore Art. Pretty easy. Dot com. Mm-hmm. And you can message me on either of those. And um, if you want to see some of my work right now, it's up in um, Piedmont Gardens. And uh, you just need your vac car- vax card. Right. Wear a mask. Um, I have work in other shows around town, but I have a show coming up at Hiller Highland in November. So. Um, yeah, and if you want a studio visit, that can be arranged too. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again for taking the time. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm.